Hello and welcome to this tutorial on passive cavitation detectors. Within this presentation we'll use a passive cavitation detector to mean a device that is a receive-only device, so a specialised hydrophone that is optimised for cavitation measurements. I'm often asked is it a direct measurement of cavitation to which the answer is sadly not. All that we can do is undertake an indirect measurement in practice, what we're doing is listening for the acoustic emissions from cavitating bubbles. There's a lot of relevant background information on another tutorial in the Precision Acoustics series. This tutorial is entitled Ultrasonic Signatures from Cavitating Bubbles. This can be found on either our website or on the Precision Acoustics YouTube channel. We'll have seen from that previous tutorial that cavitation spectra can sometimes be very complex. Here we can see multiple harmonics, subharmonics and ultraharmonics of the fundamental F0. What's also important to note is the difference in amplitudes. Quite often the fundamental can be some 40 dB larger in amplitude than the next nearest spectral component. Why might this be a problem? Well, let's just have a look at a simple sine wave here, which in the first instance looks exactly that, a pure sine wave. However, if we look closely, we can see that on the negative going excursion, there's a slight glitch and the peak negative is slightly lower in amplitude than the other surrounding cycles. In practice, what's going on here is an effect called masking. And the blue signature shown previously was actually the addition of a sine wave shown in orange with a small pulse representative of an inertial cavitation emission. The much larger amplitude of the sinusoid has completely masked the other spectral components. It's important to note that in this particular example, the difference in amplitude is only 12 dB, whereas we could expect anything up to 40 or even more decibels difference between the drive amplitude and that of any acoustic emissions. This can make detecting those emissions particularly challenging. So how might we go about addressing that? Well again if we look at our cavitation spectra we notice that we've got lots of spectral content at higher frequencies which are indicative of cavitation only. They're caused by the fundamental F0 and therefore what we need to do is use a tuned response shown here in red that optimizes our sensitivity to these higher frequency components. Typically, when designing a passive cavitation detector, we try and ensure that the center frequency is three to five times the fundamental frequency. This ensures that at the fundamental frequency F0, the reduction in sensitivity of the receive device, the PCD, is very low, some cases approaching zero, so that the amplitude of the fundamental in the PCD output signal is very much suppressed. We have another issue, and that is positional uncertainty. Regardless of whether the source of cavitation is a focused transducer, some kind of sonotrode, or laser induced cavitation, where a laser is focused into the water and produces a cavitating bubble, the cavitation is a stochastic process. We don't know exactly where that bubble will be generated. In fact, we have greatest likelihood of nowhere where we're going to be generating a bubble with the laser induced cavitation. It's likely to be at the focus of the laser. With a focus transducer, we could be seeing cavitation events anywhere within the focal region and potentially just outside. And with the sonotrode, we could be looking at widespread distributed cavitation events. So what are our strategies for dealing with the fact that we don't know exactly where the acoustic bubbles that are going to be generating cavitation signatures are? Well, if we look at a distributed situation where we have a bunch of cavitation events occurring throughout the field, as shown on the left hand side, probably the best that we can do is place a broadband hydrophone some distance from the sonotrode. And then when we have a cavitating bubble, the acoustic signature will eventually reach the hydrophone. By ensuring that hydrophone is small, it will have a broad directivity pattern, so we should have good opportunity to sense this acoustic emission. 
If, however, we've got a localised area where we're expecting to find cavitation, our region of interest where cavitation is most likely, then in that case we can employ a focused receiver where we can look specifically for signals emitting from that region of interest. This gives us the advantage of improving our signal to noise ratio because we're not interested in signals that are emanating from outside of this zone and particularly if we can arrange the focused receiver to be at 90 degrees to the acoustic axis of the drive signal we may well find that we can minimize the amplitude of drive signals coming in through to directivity effects. Cavitation damage is also something we need to be very mindful of. Let's consider here a stainless steel propeller which has got considerable signs of pitting on both its leading and its trailing edges. These are as a result of cavitation events and although in this case they're caused by the shearing of the propeller through the water they are nonetheless indication of the destructive nature of cavitation. A particularly striking example of ultrasonic induced cavitation has been produced here by the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington. Here we're looking at a stone phantom, a highly calcified structure, and you can see large chunks of material being removed from the sample itself purely due to the effects of ultrasonic cavitation. We can see that cavitation is likely to be highly damaging to anything placed within the field, and that includes any sensors, such as cavitation detectors. So what can we do to try and help? Well, actually, if we can identify again a region of interest where cavitation is most likely, placing a hydrophone within that region of interest is unlikely to be a wise course of action. Should we get an inertial cavitation event, damage to that hydrophone is highly likely. A far better strategy is to try and identify an exclusion region around the region of interest where cavitation is most likely to occur. By placing the hydrophone or passive cavitation detector outside of that region, then whenever we have cavitating bubbles, even if there are inertial events occurring within that region of interest, the hydrophone is safe from damage. So to look then at the measurement challenges this tutorial has identified, we can see that in the context of signal to noise ratio and masking, we can use a PCD with a filtered response to ensure that we're optimizing our sensitivity to the higher frequency cavitation harmonics whilst minimizing our sensitivity to the fundamental. We have an unknown location, but by identifying a target region of interest, we can improve our chances of being able to detect acoustic signatures. And by ensuring a safe distance between the cavitation events and the sensor, we can minimise the potential for damage. In fact, all three of these can, to some extent, be assisted by using a focused receiver. Often focused receivers have a predefined focal length, and as long as we ensure that this focal length is consistent with our safe operating distance, we're ensuring that the receiver is well out of the region of interest. Similarly, by ensuring that the focused receiver is pointing at the region of interest, we're running the risk of improving our signal to noise ratio. So what do we mean by using a focused receiver? One of the most common examples of that is what we call a confocal alignment. Here we have a focused source and here we have a focused receiver. And we can see that there's an overlap between those two focal regions. In fact, if we want to see how the cavitation spectra evolves throughout the focal region of the source transducer, we can scan our PCD axially to ensure that we're monitoring the acoustic emissions from different regions of space. However, we need to consider how we can set these devices up to ensure that we do have confocal alignment. We'll start by introducing a ball reflector something like a, a steel ball into the acoustic field. We'll have a focused source transducer and whilst the focused source is normally used as a transmit only device, we'll exploit its pulse echo nature and we will actually look to receive the signal that comes back to it as well. We'll look at the pulse echo signal. Now clearly if we use long drive signals this becomes impossible to separate received from transmitted signal, 
So we need to use short or impulsive drive signals, maybe a single cycle at the fundamental frequency of the transducer. Then by monitoring that pulse echo back reflected signal, we can translate the source transducer axially and in both transverse directions to ensure that we have maximum back reflected signal from the ball bearing. This will ensure that the ball bearing is within the focal region of the source. Without moving the source, although I'll remove it from the diagram for clarity, we'll now introduce our PCD. This also will be driven pulse echo. Again, PCDs would normally be a receive only device, but by driving them as a pulse echo transducer, we can employ exactly the same techniques as we did with the source transducer. We'll translate it axially and transversely to ensure that we get maximum back reflection from our PCD. The final stage of the process is to remove the ball reflector. And again, for clarity, I've now reintroduced the focus source on the diagram, whereas in practice, we would not have moved it within the tank. And this ensures that we have both the focused source and the PCD with overlapping focal regions. Another popular configuration is coaxial alignment. <clears throat> However, this requires that either the source transducer or the PCD are of an annular structure. In this case, I've shown an annular source transducer, which has an aperture through the middle through which the PCD has been introduced. And we can see that the two focal regions overlap, albeit one has a slightly longer focal length than the other. So how do we go about achieving this setup experimentally? Once again, we'll make use of our ball reflector and our focused source transducer will be aligned much the same way as we did with the confocal alignment for maximum back reflected signal. Now, when we introduce the PCD through the annulus in the middle, we don't need to worry about transverse alignment we simply need to worry about axial adjustment to ensure that the focal regions overlap. As previously, we're looking at the pulse echo signal on the PCD to ensure this happens. And finally, we remove that ball reflector to ensure that our configuration is ready for our measurements. So to summarize then, Passive cavitation detectors require careful design to optimize their spatial and their frequency response. This is normally done in close collaboration with the equipment provider. And when using PCDs, alignment is critical to ensure that we both protect the sensor and ensure reliable measurements. We hope you found this tutorial interesting. If you did, please come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial series.